Today I'm building a wireless temperature sensor and I'm going to walk you through a couple of the steps. First of all, I'll go through the electronics and wiring and how you put them together. And then I'll go through the software, how to program the microcontroller and also how to log the data. So you end up with a beautiful graph like this. My goal here is to make a small wireless sensor I can put around the house or even outside on my balcony to record the temperature. And there's a couple of key design things I want out of it. First of all, that wireless part. I don't want to be running wires around the house just to be able to log temperature. I want to stick it somewhere in a corner and have it just log over my wireless network, normal Wi-Fi. The second thing is battery powered. I don't want to have to power the thing either. If it's on the balcony, especially running a wire through a window and having that kind of stuff out there seems pretty ill-conceived. And so it's important it has a battery as well. So where do we start? Well, the most important part is the sensor itself. For temperature, you have a couple of options, but the cheapest option and the one I had in the box was a thermistor. Thermistors are small, tiny devices that are basically resistors that change their resistance with the temperature. You just stick them in a circuit, measure the resistance, and away you go. Most of them are what's called negative temperature coefficient thermistors. That means as you increase the temperature, the resistance decreases. So if I just sit there and sort of held it in my hand like this, the resistance is going down as I'm holding it. And similarly, if you plunge it into some ice water, the resistance will shoot up. And the second part of this equation is the wireless. Now, there are a lot of options for wireless, Raspberry Pis being one of the easiest ones to program, but they're quite power hungry. And so instead, I'm turning to microcontrollers. Again, the most obvious one here is the Arduino, and I've got a whole box full of different kinds of Arduino. But in this case, I want something that's even smaller and lighter and has built-in Wi-Fi. And for this, I'm turning to the ESP8266. Now, I first heard about the ESP when it was a small chip like this that you plugged into an Arduino or something else to do wireless. You sort of talk with it over serial and it does the wireless for you and sends you the data back. But it turns out that on the chip, there is also a microcontroller. You can program this thing. It has you know, a little bit of storage space and some processing power. Now, you can't use this tiny chip by itself. This pin out here only has eight pins and you can't really talk to it very well. So instead, I have a development board or an expanded board. What it has is an ESP8266 combined with a lot of stuff that makes your life easier. A lot of pinouts, a small serial port, a battery controller and charger, and also a voltage regulator, so you can plug it straight into five volts. And the one I'm using here is the Adafruit Hazar. It's a small, nice little board. It has good pinouts, and it has excellent compatibility with the Arduino IDE. So even though you're not using an Arduino, you can still program in the Arduino language and upload and download with almost the same level of ease as a normal Arduino. Now, in order to measure the temperature that the thermistor is experiencing, I need to measure its resistance. And to measure its resistance, I actually need to measure voltage because the only thing that the ESP and most microcontrollers can do is measure voltage on a pin. Now, in order to measure the voltage, I've made a voltage divider. A voltage divider is a small circuit with two resistors that basically takes a voltage and bisects it. And you take the voltage in the middle of those two resistors. As you change the values of the resistors to bigger and smaller, the voltage you get in the middle of them changes based on the ratio of the two resistors. And so using this, we can take our thermistor and put it in series with another resistor that is a fixed value. And then as the thermistor changes resistance, it will change the voltage in the middle of that pair. I've used a breadboard to prototype what that looks like because I don't like soldering until I am really sure of the values. And in this case, it's a bit trickier because I have to keep within a zero to one volt range on the analog measuring pin. The ESP is quite limited in what it can measure. So here I have the breadboard laid out. There's a pair of one kilo ohm resistors that make a two kilo ohm value for one side of my divider. And then a 4K7 thermistor, that's a thermistor that reads about 4.7 kilo ohms at room temperature, in series with a 10 kilo ohm fixed resistor. This is so that the equation works out so even if the thermistor is zero, as in it's very, very hot and resistance is basically nothing, the voltage on the analog pin is still one volt. That ratio I've got there of two to 10 works out pretty well for keeping it in a safe range. As the thermistor gets colder and colder and increases in resistance, it adds more and more to that top side of that divider and brings the voltage down and down closer to zero. So I can take that measurement of one to zero volts 
and work out using a small equation what the resistance of that thermistor is. Once it's hooked up into the ESP, just into three pins, 3.3 volts for one end, ground for the other end, and then the analog measurement for the center of the divider, we're ready to go. We have all we need to do our measurement and our Wi-Fi. The ESP has Wi-Fi built in, so all we need to do now is fire up the Arduino IDE and start programming. So I'm going to start by showing you a basic measurement program. There's no Wi-Fi here, just measuring the resistance of the thermistor and turning it into temperature with the right equations. First of all, let's look at our constants at the top of the program. We have three constants here that specify the voltage divider. One resistor which is next to the thermistor, the other resistor which is the other side of the voltage divider, and the voltage being supplied into the top of the divider. These combined, let's turn the voltage at the top of the divider into the resistance of the thermistor. Let's scroll down and see how we do that. Here, we see we read the voltage from the analog pin. Now, the analog pin reads 0 to 1 volts, but it turns that into a number between 0 and 1023. So we divide it back down again to a float in the right range, 0 to 1. We have our voltage. We've taken the equation for a voltage divider and inverted it. So we can put in both the voltage supplied, the fixed resistance value, and the voltage measured, and get out the total resistance of the top side. Now, of course, we have a second resistor in series with that first thermistor in that top side of the divider. So finally, to get the resistance, we subtract that first resistor, and then, because all my values are in kilo ohms, multiply by 1,000 to get the value in ohms. Now, we have a resistance. We need to turn it into a temperature. And the way you turn resistances of thermistors into temperatures is something called the Steinhardt Hart equation. The Steinhardt Hart equation is a bit too complicated to explain right now, but there's a couple of versions, a simplified version and a more complex version. Here I've used a simplified version. We just have one coefficient called beta, a nominal resistance, and nominal temperature. Now, if you're lucky enough to have a data sheet for your thermistor, you can get these values pretty easily. If you don't though, like me, and just have a box full of random components, you're going to have to measure the thermistor and find out what its coefficients are. I took my thermistor into three known temperatures and measured the resistance it had in those temperatures. In this case, room temperature, my fridge, and my freezer. Taking these temperatures, I can then put them into a calculation program, such as this one on the Stanford Research Services website. You just put in your three values here, and it gives you both the full coefficients for the complex model, and also the simplified ones, the model we're using. And here's beta. Once you have those values, you can then implement the Steinhardt Hart equation. The reason we're using the simplified one is because, well, it's simpler to implement. These lines here are the inverse of the equation, where we can feed in the resistance and get out the temperature it would be at. And once we have the temperature, which is in Kelvin, we pull down by 273.15 degrees, which of course is how you convert from Kelvin to Celsius, and return that temperature. All in all, we end up with a nice loop, which every five seconds measures the voltage, works out the resistance, and then tells us that temperature in Celsius. As you can see, I already have it running right here. In fact, if I put my finger on the thermistor, you can see the voltage increase and the temperature increasing as well. So my software is off to a pretty good start. I'm measuring the voltage, turning it into a resistance, and then turning the resistance into a temperature. So what's the next step? Well, the breadboard is nice for prototyping, but it's not really going to hold up under sort of constant use. So I'm going to take the components and solder them into something a little bit more permanent. It's a small circuit board called a feather wing, which you can buy specifically for the device I have, but any sort of normal soldering board will do in this case. So let's get started. So here we are, ready to start soldering. First of all, I need to take the headers and put them onto the board. There we go. The headers are soldered onto the feather wing. It's looking pretty good. One bent pin, but it's easily fixed. Next thing is to take our breadboard arrangement and transfer it onto here.
and how to snip off the wires and solder them in properly. And there we go, the main components are now soldered onto the board. Before I put the final wire in from the center of the divider down to the analog pin, I'm just gonna test with the multimeter to make sure everything looks good. And there we have it, the final prototype board. It's not very pretty, but it's much better than a breadboard, and it will survive a decent number of conditions. Well, that fits together quite nicely, so let's put it aside and get back to the Arduino IDE. So here's the Wi-Fi version, and as you can see already, it's a lot more complicated. There's a whole new block of constants of the file, and I'll try and explain them quickly. First of all, Wi-Fi details. This is the name of my wireless network, and this is where the password would go if I hadn't removed it because I'm not that stupid. And then on the database. In this example, I'm using InfluxDB. It's a good time series database where you can easily submit values over HTTP posts, and it's perfect for this kind of operation. What I've got here is the host and port it's running on. This is my server, Lucario. And then the database itself. Database name, the username to log in as, and the password. Again, here, it's not really password. Finally, a couple of things to send to Influx with our measurement. Firstly, the measurement name. This is both the name and a series of tags, so we can retrieve it later and do different graphs based on it. And then the name of the field, which here is value to match my other temperature logging sensors. The rest of these constants are the same as before, so we'll skip over them and get to the meat of the program. In the setup process, there's an extra piece, which is the Wi-Fi initialization. It's not too hard to do, and there's some good examples that come with the ESP8266 Wi-Fi library, but this is the basic way you connect to a SSID, make sure you're connected, and then just for extra giggles, print the local IP for debugging on the serial console. Our resistance to Celsius function makes a return here, it's the same as it was before, and now we get to the main loop. The first difference is the delay is 10 seconds. I only need temperature every 10 seconds, it's not going to change that much. Around this we have a couple of writes to make the LED on the ESP8266 board that I have flash on and off so we know when it's transmitting data. Next, the same voltage and printing we had before but tidied up a little bit. And then on to the actual sending. First of all, we make a brand new Wi-Fi client. This is the ESP8266 library's way of making a thing that just talks to a host and a port over TCP. It's a raw connection, there's nothing special about it, it's not even HTTP based. As you'll see in a second, we have to just send raw bytes down it, but this is where we want to go. The host and the port are the things we set at the top of the file a second ago. Then we work out what we're going to send in our request. Now, when you send to Influx, you send it a simple post request to a special URL with a body containing the measurements. In fact, here's the documentation to give you some idea. All we do is post to a URL called write with db my db, and then send the data in this binary format, which is essentially the measurement name, then a space, then the field name, an equal sign, and the value. Authentication is also easy. We simply put u and p as get parameters into the URL and put the username and password in there directly. We end up with a URL that's just slash write with db equals database, u equals username, and p equals password. It's very simple and very easy to post to. The last part is making that post body. Remember, it's just the measurement name, a space, the field name, an equal sign, and then the temperature value. And that's it. We have our URL, we have our post body, all we need to do now is post it to the server. Now in this case, we're not using an HTTP library, we have a raw TCP connection. So rather than doing anything fancy, we just have to send the basic structure of HTTP as raw bytes. That means we send post, then the URL, then HTTP slash 1.1, new line, and then a host header and a connection header. These two are basic requirements to make the server understand 
not only where we're sending to, but also to make sure it doesn't try and hold the connection open for us afterwards. Then we send the content length, which is set to the length of our string in the post body, a fresh new line, and then finally the body. After that, we just wait for a response. Also, here's a little trick from the examples in the ESP library. You can actually have a timeout, and if it waits for more than five seconds, it just says it's timed out and goes back around the loop again. This means that the client won't get stuck on one bad connection or if the connection drops temporarily. Finally, for debugging purposes, we read back the HTTP response and print it to the serial console just so we can be sure what's happening. Overall, it's a pretty short file, 134 lines with lots of new lines and comments. Hopefully, you have a decent idea of how this works. I'll post up the file so you can read through it at your own leisure and adapt it to your own needs. There are a couple of changes you can make here. In particular, you can change from influx to something else, but in this case, influx is a very easy option to go for, and it's very easy to get set up. In my case, I just use their Docker image and set it up in pretty much its default configuration, just adding a username and password for a little bit of extra security. Now, let's take a look at using Grafana. Grafana is a way of taking the data from InfluxDB and making it into nice graphs. It's very configurable and pretty easy to set up, so it's perfect for this kind of application. Here I've already got a graph. This graph is of the temperature in my living room, and it's drawn from a sensor in one of my servers. So it's using a different method of logging data, but into the same measurement inside Influx. So I want to add to this the measurements from our little device that we just built. The first thing to do is add a new query, then find the measurement, in this case called temperature, then we have a graph. But this graph is of every temperature measurement in the entire database, which means both the living room and the other one. So I add a host filter to the ESP device, and then for just for safety, add a location filter to outdoors. And now we have a graph just of the data that our device is sending. As you can see, it's about 16 degrees outside, getting a little warmer in the morning. And here you can see the peak where I bought it inside and it warmed up a little bit. Well, that's pretty much it for Grafana. It's a very flexible system. You can put all sorts of data into this one. I have the same system doing my server metrics, my hard drive space, and a whole lot of other stuff. But for this case, that's all you need. You just plug in the temperature and away you go. So we've got our Wi-Fi communication done and it's sending values to our server. We're pretty much done with the build. The last thing to do is to add a battery. Now there's a couple of options here. The easy option, which works for most boards, including Arduinos, is to just use a big external USB battery pack. Stick a cable in one end, stick a pack in the other end, and it will go for an incredibly long time. However, one of the reasons I choose the Adafruit boards is they come with a built-in battery circuit. You can take a tiny lithium polymer battery and plug it into the side. Not only can it take the battery and rectify it to a useful voltage, it can also recharge the battery over USB. So you can take the whole unit, circuit board and battery, and put it into a small box, and then just plug it into USB every so often to recharge it. Well, that's pretty much it for the build. There's a couple more things I could have done, the most interesting one being using the deep sleep mode on the ESP to save a bit more power. But for now, I'm pretty happy with what I have. So I'm going to take my new device, stick it outside, and start measuring the temperature. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I'll see you next time.